Okay, good afternoon everybody and welcome back to Sunoikis Digital Classics Summer Term 2021. Today is our eighth session of this semester and with this session we start with a group of two sessions about uh, in general name entities uh, for historical languages and today uh, we have a session about Trismegistos people. Jan Brooks is uh, with us uh, today, she's part of the Trismegistos uh, uh, team and so she will be able today to talk about about, specifically about Trismegistos people. So we start talking about the prosopography, onomastics, and name entity recognition today with this uh, uh, session. Uh, as usual, uh, our uh, class outline is on GitHub, where we, you have a description of this outline, uh, links, uh, possible readings, and then we will also add uh, slides. Um, in, so, um, Jan, welcome back to uh, Sunoikis' Digital Classics, because you already contributed to the project. So we are very happy to, to have you again uh, today. Uh, and I think we, you, um, we can start. So Jan, please. Uh, okay, here we are. Okay, and I, okay. Is my screen visible? Yes, yes it is. Okay, great. So thank you, Monica, for the uh, nice introduction. Um, so I'll be presenting uh, TM People today, which is our uh, prosopographic onomastic database, uh, which currently focuses on Greek, Roman, and Byzantine Egypt, uh, and it's part of the wider uh, Trismegistos project. So I'll be starting with a very short history of Trismegistos itself and a short overview to kind of contextualize the TM People database. Um, then I'll, I'll give a brief overview and history of TM People itself. Um, and then in the third part, uh, I'd like to show you some of the new features that we are currently developing for uh, the new website so that you as in end users will be able to use uh, in the near future. So um, Trismegistos um, started out uh, in 2004. Um, it was created during a project called Multilingualism and Multiculturalism in Greco-Roman Egypt. Uh, it was a collaboration between uh, the KU Leuven here in Leuven in Belgium and the University of Cologne. Um, and um, to study this, this subject of multilingualism and multiculturalism, uh, Mark de Pau, who was the project director, um, he realized that uh, in order to do this, uh, an integrated system was needed to overcome uh, the disciplinary fragmentation uh, that exists. Um, because we have people who are specialized in papyrology, in Greek papyrology, in demotic papyrology, Coptic papyrology, there are Egyptologists, and so on, so it's all very fragmented. Uh, and so the project's initial goal was uh, to link existing projects, such as, uh, for example, the Heidelberg Gesamtverzeichnis, uh, which collected uh, metadata on Greek and Latin Apological documents with a chronological focus. Um, and also at the same time, create a parallel system for the Egyptian material, which didn't really exist at the time. But when setting uh, up the project, uh, several uh, questions arose. The first one was why would we only focus on papyrological texts? Inscriptions are also valuable when studying language shifts. And in Egyptology, the writing surface never led to disciplinary boundaries. So why would we? do that now. Uh, second question was why separate the Egyptian material from Greek and Latin? The three languages were used in the same region at the same time. There are many bilingual texts, so that didn't really seem to make sense either. And why only the Greek or Roman period? Because Demotic starts much earlier, Greek is used up until the Arabic period, so here again the boundaries didn't really seem to make sense. So they decided, well, it's better to integrate everything into a single, more extensive system. And that was when uh, Trismegistos was born. Um, so in 2006, this went live. Uh, and as you can see here at the time, um, it contained all published documents between uh, 800 BC and 8800. So there is a chronological limitation there. But um, they didn't discriminate on the type of text, so documentary texts are in there, literary texts, magical texts, 
all languages and scripts attested in Egypt during their and all writing materials. Um, in 2010, then, um, when um, Trismegistos got involved in uh, projects focusing on Latin epigraphy, um, it started uh, to expand. And um, since then, actually, um, we don't really have any restrictions anymore except for the chronological uh, focus. So our main fo focus is still 800 BC to 8800. We make some exception for Egypt uh, pre-800, um, but only for Egypt. Um, and so we include documents from all over the ancient world. And now we also integrate unpublished texts because more and more material is being put online. Museums, for example, they, they put a lot of data online even though uh, these texts aren't published. And so we incorporate uh, that as well. So the map gives you a kind of an idea of, um, of the scope. So we have texts all the way from Scandinavia to Sudan, from Portugal to the Indus Valley. Um, so, Basically, everything that's relevant is included in the database. And one of the most important purposes of Trismegistus is to overcome disciplinary fragmentation. Uh, we're all more or less trained in a specific area. Each area has, each discipline, discipline has its own standards and customs. And it's often difficult to navigate other disciplines. We tend to stick to our comfort zone, our home tower here, so to speak. And Trismegistus wants to make it easier to overcome these boundaries. Um, the core database in this respect in Trismegistus is the text database. This is the database of sources. This is where everything starts from our sources. This is forms the basis of everything. Um, currently, we have a little over 900,000 texts in there. And um, we provide information about texts. Um, one of the uh, main things we do is identify and distribute. So um, here, for example, you see the famous Rosetta Stone. Uh, depending on the discipline, this is referred to in a lot of different ways. So Greek epigraphers tend to use the publication number, which is OGIS volume 190. Well, Egyptologists tend to use the inventory number, which is British Museum EA24. The general public knows this stone as the Rosetta Stone, which is named after the town where uh, it was found. Um, and in the little video on the right, you can see the very long list of publications of this text. So it's not always easy to find all this information. So what we do in Trismegistos is we group all this information together under a stable identifier, which is a unique number. Uh, and this doesn't tend to change. In this case, for the Rosetta Stone, this is TM8809. And that number contains all information about this text, not just publications, but also dates, provenance, um, anything related to it. Uh, this is very important in a digital environment because for a computer, these things are definitely not the same. Even very minor variations are different for a computer. So if you take uh, the publication, OGIS volume 190, if you write the one as a Roman numeral or an Arabic numeral is already different for the computer. So those are two different things. If you add full stops after the capitals, this is also different for the computer. So if people use different conventions, it's very difficult to kind of, um, well, bring everything together. So that's why we use the number. It's very unambiguous and very clear uh, for a computer that 8,809 is this text. Um, it's also used in, uh, in stable URIs, as you can see here, um, which takes you to the detail page for this text. And this is uh, what we use to create a linked open data environment. Um, also important to note um, is that we don't offer the full text um, 
for uh, sources. Uh, we leave that up to other projects. Um, for Greek papyri, we do have text, um, but this is mainly um, part of a separate uh, database in Trismegistus called Trismegistus Words, and this is not the canonical text, so for that you need to go to other projects. Uh, we also don't add images, so that's also something we leave up to others. Uh, another thing we want to facilitate for users is searching for texts, uh, which is why disambiguation is so important. Uh, you can search for individual texts in Trismegistus, but you can also use multiple search criteria. Um, the example here on the slide um, shows you um, if you search for uh, all texts written in Latin uh, in Upper Egypt, you get 446 results. And uh, you get this kind of, uh, you get a chronological distribution, but also um, distribution for the languages. So uh, if you search for Latin, you also get bilingual texts there, and also the writing surface um, is shown. Um, and with these tools, uh, we, we want to facilitate uh, quantification, uh, of course. Now, this Trismegistus number is not only used internally for disambiguation purposes, but also externally. Um, so other projects, uh, when they share their data, we link it to the correct TM number. If it's a new text, we create a new TM number and then feed the information back to the project and link to them on our website. Uh, partners also show the TM number on their websites often, and um, we also have an API that they can use to pull in data from Trismegistus uh, automatically. So our main goal is basically to bridge those disciplinary towers that I showed earlier. This is uh, a very simplified schematic overview of Trismegistus' current structure. So in the center, you see the text database and surrounding it are all, are all these subsidiary databases which contain a particular type of information about uh, our sources or in the case of TM people and TM places, for example, information that is mentioned in the sources. And they are all linked to this central text database. Um, just as for the text, the main goals of these related tables are all the same. Um, we want to uh, disambiguate um, certain information. Uh, we want to offer um, search um, possibilities, and we want people to be able to quantify. Um, so for example, when uh, working on place names, um, even then disambiguation is important because for example, uh, the name Alexandria can refer to nine different cities from Egypt to Pakistan. Uh, each of these nine cities has a different stable identifier. Uh, the Alexandria in Egypt, for example, is TMGO100. Now, um, today we're going to focus on TM People, which is one of these uh, subsidiary databases. And uh, TM People, as we know it under that name, uh, has now been around for a little over a decade. Um, it wasn't always called TM People. Uh, there's a long history preceding the current version, going back all the way to the 1940s. Uh, so as you can see on the timeline, these, the project is uh, almost a century old now. Um, the predecessor to TM People is the Protopographia Ptolemaica. Now, the aim of that project um, was to collect all inhabitants of the Ptolemaic Empire. Uh, initially, this was all people with a title or an occupation. And here you see an overview of the different uh, volumes that have appeared. Uh, started with the civil and financial administration, the army and police, clergy, notaries, tribunals, agri agriculture and husbandry, trade and industry, uh, everyone involved in transport, both on land and on water. Uh, and then the fifth volume revolved around the courts and international relations. Um, there was a long gap then, which was used to create indices and, and addenda. And then in 2002, the final paper volume appeared focusing on people uh, who had a foreign ethnic. 
So um, how do you tackle such an ambitious project before the digital day and age? Well, as was usual then, they used index cards. These index cards were stored alphabetically in a very large filing cabinet. We still have the cabinet in our office today with the original index cards inside. Um, here you see uh, on the left, in the left picture, for example, an index card for Harmaes and Deus. Um, they appear, uh, so the, let me see if I can get my pointer. Um, here's the source in which they appear. Uh, it's P. Kairosinon, volume two, 59,294 on line one. Um, and uh, so the card is in Dutch, but it says that they file a complaint with Xenon, the estate manager for whom they work, uh, and they were brick makers. Um, and so they, as you can see in the top right corner, this was added later, they were uh, incorporated in the fifth volume of uh, the PP. Now, uh, these index cards, they were consulted one by one to create the manuscripts that form the basis of the books. Uh, at that time, there were no computers yet, so these manuscripts had to be written by hand. Um, and as you can see, if something was forgotten or a mistake was made, um, the, the page was kind of pasted over with a new scrap of paper. And this would then go to the publisher who would um, type it and print it out. So um, here, the, the part that was pasted over is 6,849A is this part uh, in the final book here. So that's what it looked like in those days. Um, from the start, the project was uh, rather innovative in several ways. Um, so in the first place, um, the, the founders of the projects, um, Professor Peromans and Professor Van Tech, they realized that for multilingual societies such as Hellenistic Egypt, it was counterproductive to discriminate on the basis of char or language. So all possible sources were taken into consideration. Even though the PI of the project, Bedemans, he couldn't read any Egyptian language himself, but he realized that it was necessary to include this material. Um, secondly, very important was that they created what they called the PP number. So this was already a numerical identifier that was awarded to each individual, attested in a particular function, as they call it. So this made it much more easier to distinguish between people who had the same name and held the same function. But it was also very useful for cross-references. Because a lot of people, they held multiple positions, either simultaneously or consecutively. They often need to be included in more than one book under different titles, so these numbers made it possible to cross-reference. Um, so for that time, um, this system was pretty revolutionary, so we're speaking about the 1940s when all this was set up. Uh, in a digital environment like today, this is all pretty self-evident, but this is long before the advent of uh, a computer in the humanities. So the system of a unique volume per a unique number per person per volume was the best way to cope with this data at the time when the only publication format was a book format. Now this would already have been a, a Titanic project in digital format and they succeeded doing everything on paper for the first 30 years or so. Um, 40 years. Um, but relatively early on, the curators of the PP realized that going digital would survive, uh, provide a solution to many practical problems. So um, as Professor Moore, who was, was the successor of Peramans and, and kind of led the project uh, in the 80s, he called it the computerization of the documentation. Um, and this started in, in the mid 80s. Uh, but it took a lot of time. Um, so uh, I think uh, work on the PP, putting everything in the database was done until the early 2000s, I think. Um, 
this had several reasons several reasons so there were um some technical issues in the beginning um there was a lot of experimentation with hardware and software uh, eventually they settled on mac computers and filemaker as the database software um and we still use that today and there were also a lot of problems with fonts uh something that luckily has been solved in the meantime thanks to unicode but at the time it didn't exist yet so they really struggled with that in the beginning uh there was also the problem of funding the pp had never been a funded project uh, which is a situation in which we find ourselves again these past years, unfortunately. Uh, everything was done on the side by staff and students, uh, which caused its own problems since uh, there was a lot of fluctuation of temporary staff, which is a very costly affair because once, well, you have to train people and then once you've got them trained and they're used to, to everything and they know how everything works, they leave, you have to search for new people and stuff. So, um, yeah, that kind of slowed things down a lot. Um, now, the digital version was for that time, again, um, a rather complex relational database with several tables to store different types of information, um, which you can see here presented schematically. Um, so the, the basis of it all was the text file where the sources were stored. Uh, linked to the text file was the reference file, which had all the attestations of the individuals. And these attestations were linked to four other databases, the name file uh, storing all the names, the person file storing all the individual people, and the family file storing the family relations between the people. And finally, the function file where all the different um, functions, so offices, occupations, titles, uh, were stored. Now this uh, allowed for um, a wide variety of queries, um, which was quite ex exceptional for that time. Um, and the FileMaker environment was even set up on a server to which two computers were connected so that two people could work on it simultaneously. Um, now today, we don't even think of this, I mean, we work on it 20, 30, 40 people at the same time. But at that time, it was really amazing that two people could work on that database at the same time. Um, for the publication, the book form wasn't completely abandoned. So as I said, in 2002, volume 10 uh, was published on foreign ethnics. But the idea, once they went um, digital, was to start publishing on CD-ROM. Uh, it never came this far, though, because the internet appeared and developed very quickly. So in 2004, um, the website was launched, and so people could consult it online. Um, but apparently, the website broke down pretty quickly after a couple of months, apparently. And as far as I know, it never went online again after that. So people worked on the database in the background in FileMaker. Um, but there never has really been a fully functioning online version of the PP. Um, so during the 80s and 90s, people assistants continued to work on the PP, often in the context of other projects, or mainly in the context of other projects. Uh, the most important one was the historical topography of the Fayoum project, carried out between 1998 and 2002. Um, many new entries were added for people living in the Fayoum, not only people with the title. And this is the first time that the chronological time frame was extended to the Roman period. But after 2002, the uh, PP didn't see uh, much action. It kind of went dormant uh, until 2008. So when the uh, multilingualism project in Cologne was finished, a new project was set up in Leuven, Creating Identities Project, uh, which was to study identity formation in the multicultural society of Roman Egypt. So in a certain way, this was a continuation of the multilingualism project, which led to the creation of Trismegistos. But now the focus was specifically on onomastic habits of the population and how names were used to express identity. 
And this is when TM people was born. Obviously, um, we had a lot to fall back on. So this is when I joined the project also, by the way. Um, so we had a lot to fall back on, thanks to the PP, not only in terms of data, but also the database structure. And both were used as a starting point for TM people. But we expanded in two directions. So firstly, chronologically. So ideally, we wanted TM people to adhere to the same time span as Trismegistus in general, so 800 BC to AD 800. But due to practical reasons, the core data is limited to roughly 330 BC to AD 800, at least as far as people attested in, in Greek texts go. Um, we also decided to include all attested individuals, not only those with a title or an ethnic or so. so anyone mentioned in, in our sources. Now to add the data here, um, different strategies were used depending on the language and script of the sources. And essentially this boiled down to whether or not a full text database is available. Since no such repositories exist for texts written in Egyptian scripts, these had to be entered manually. And this is also the reason then why we didn't start in 800 BC uh, for TM people, because entering data manually is very, very time consuming because you have to type over each, each name. And since the focus of the uh, C grade project was the Greek or Roman period, we started in we never really gotten around to finishing this because it's just so much work. So we're still missing um, some data in this respect. Uh, things were different for Coptic though, since um, we were able to collaborate with Alain de Latre from the University of Brussels, who had been compiling a database of people in Coptic papyri. And he was so kind to share his data with us. So we do have a lot for Coptic uh, papyrology. Coptic inscriptions, on the other hand, were uh, only uh, partially processed because this had to be done manually as well. Uh, same for Greek and Latin inscriptions. They were also entered manually. So although there's the Packard Humanities website, which has the full text of a lot of Greek inscriptions, also from Egypt, they weren't willing to share. So we did those manually, also the Latin ones. But luckily, the largest corpus, namely the Greek uh, documentary papyrological texts, they were available in the Duke Data Bank of Documentary Papyri, which is now part of papyri.info. And uh, we were allowed to use their data. Um, and at the time, so in 2008, they had about 50,000 documents there. And to process these, we used named entities. Um, so basically with NER, you teach the computer how to recognize these names and how to interpret name sequences. Uh, because uh, people are often identified by more than just their given name. They often add a patronymic or a metronymic and you need to teach the computer how to recognize this. And you need two things to filter out and tag these names. An onomastic gazetteer and a rule book. Uh, an onomastic gazetteer is basically just a compilation of names which you feed to the computer. The computer matches this to the full text. Um, in our case, we reduced the full text first to only those words that are capitalized, um, just to already filter out a lot of noise uh, in the beginning. And then we match those capitalized words with this list of names. And if there's a match, it's marked as a name. Uh, if, there's, uh, if the capitalized word was not matched, it was marked as to be checked, just to make sure that perhaps it was a name that wasn't in our list that we didn't miss it. Um, of course, such a list of names doesn't materialize out of thin air, um, but we already had the PP to fall back on. So we already had a very large corpus of names. And so the capitalized words that were not recognized were checked manually afterwards. 
um, and uh, those that turned out to be names were marked manually. Uh, now, this onomastic gazetteer consists of um, three levels. So you have names, you have name variants, because names can be spelled in different ways within the same language, but can also be rendered differently in uh, other languages. So the Greek name Isidorus, Isidorus, for example, can be written Isidorus in Greek. It's Isidorus in Latin. Then you have the Coptic script. And in Demotic, you have Isitris, for example. But there's an extra complication for Greek and Latin because these are case languages. Um, and if you only use the names or the name variants, which are generally in the nominative form, a lot of attestations would not be recognized because they're written in a different case. So that's why we had to inflect all of these names first and use that, that list was used as the basis for NER. So this is our numvac case uh, table. Um, so once these were matched and uh, we filtered out all these, all these names, um, we used a kind of rule book to cope with strings of names. And we call these strings of names identification clusters. Um, so because they not only consist of the person's given name, but often also extra genealogical identifiers. Uh, and so these rule books, they take into account the specific case endings to determine what the cluster role is of each name in the identification cluster. So for example, if you have Pete Arcentos Panopunios, Pete Arcentos is a nominative, Panopunios is a genitive, this is interpreted as a person and his patronym. Hirge uh, Kostuotos Tu Cassandro is a dative followed by a genitive, followed by tu followed by another genitive. This is automatically interpreted as a person followed by his patronymic and his patronymic. And these strings can get very long and complicated, such as the last example shows, where you have a person, Dionysio Toikai Amoi, followed by his father, Fani Utukai Amoi, followed by the grandfather the mother and the maternal grandfather. So we have a long rule book that tries to deal with as many possible situations to automatically uh, tag these clusters. And we use these in turn to automatically create family trees for these people. Now, thanks to this procedure, we were able to add some uh, 350,000 attestations of names from these Greek papyri and ostraca. And together with the data that was added manually from the Egyptian material, we ended up with uh, 493,000 attestations in 2011 when we finished this. Um, so this new procedure also led us to expand on the database structure of the PP. So this is uh, the structure I showed you before of the PP. This is what the structure of TM people uh, looks like now. So as you can see here, we've added the Namvar and Namvar case tables to deal with name variants and declined name variants. Uh, the family relations database uh, has been discarded because we solve that now by doing self loops with the person database. And the function database has also been expanded a bit. We have now a FUREF database which deals with attestations of functions and the food database is an um, overarching um, table which groups together uh, all attestations that refer to the same function. Uh, as for the software setup, we took that from the PP as well, uh, not just for TM people, but for Trismegistos in general, by the way. So to this day, our backend remains FileMaker. Uh, we use FileMaker because we find that it provides the right balance between user friendliness. It's really, really easy to start to work in FileMaker, uh, even for people who have almost no um, computer experience. But it also uh, offers quite some advanced functionality. 
So for example, um, the original NER procedure was set up in an XML environment by an IT specialist uh, because we didn't have anyone with enough programming experience at the time. But after the secret project, um, we set up a new NER environment in FileMaker itself, which made it much more easier for us to improve it, to update it, and integrate the resulting records in our own database. Uh, for the front end, so the part that you use online, uh, we use uh, MySQL, so we have a MySQL database. Uh, this is updated every week with exports from the FileMaker database, and it's queried through PHP. So that's what you see on the website, and that's what I'll show uh, later on uh, in the session. Uh, this is an example of a file in FileMaker. Um, as you can see, there's a lot of information in there. Uh, we tried to store as much as possible uh, about these um, attestations, but this is not what you get to see online. So this is what we work in, uh, and then a lot of this data is exported to the online database, uh, and that's what we use for the website. Uh, now, the new team people opened up a lot of new possibilities for onomastic research. Um, it was a very important step forward, um, not only for the data set itself, but also the way it was structured, uh, because it really allowed us to uh, easily quantify um, things, provide a more solid and objective basis for hypotheses making claims about identity using personal names. Um, and here on the slide, there are just a couple of examples. So uh, I myself, I worked on, on double names, uh, for example. Um, there was someone else who worked on theophoric names. Uh, then uh, other people looked at Christian names and, and tried to calculate the conversion rates in Egypt on the basis of these names. Uh, and there's still a lot of research going on thanks to this database. Um, now, after the Creating Identities project ended in 2012, uh, we found ourselves in the same situation as the PP before us. There was no more funding, um, and believe me, it was not for lack of trying. So again, work on TM People became something that was done on the side. Um, it's basically just me and Vili Clarissa, who's uh, a retired professor. Um, who's been working uh, on the PP since his early career in the 80s, and he continues to help out today. Uh, but basically, it's just the two of us, so progress has been pretty slow. Um, this doesn't mean nothing has happened in the past eight, decade. Uh, so for one, I uh, got a small grant to test the feasibility of our NER procedure uh, for Latin inscriptions in 2016. Uh, so I worked on this with some students back then, um, and the first results were actually pretty promising. So the first phase of the, where the, the text was compared to the onomastic gazetteer, um, about 85% uh, was recognized by the computer, and we were able, um, sorry, no, 92% uh, was recognized by the computer, and we were able to check 85% of the results at that time. So it actually went uh, quite smoothly, but uh, because there's no follow-up funding, uh, I couldn't proceed to the next to the next step, which was matching matching with the rule book. Um, so the data has just been lying around, which is actually a shame because there's just so much that can be done with it. Um, so last year, I started working on on two small provinces in my free time, and they're actually almost finished. So it's the two Mauritania provinces. Um, the only thing I need to do is actually add the name variants that aren't in our gazetteer yet, but I've had to put that on hold for now because I really need to finish the new TM People website. Um, but once I get those last names in the database, those two provinces are ready to go online and the data will be, will be made public. Um, there's one important distinction with the Egyptian material, though. Um, we won't be doing a prosopographical level for for provinces, for other provinces than, than Egypt. 
Um, this is not just for lack of time, it's also because we feel that we don't really have the necessary experience for this. Um, but if anyone else wants to do this, we're more than happy to share our data, but in TM people, we're just going to focus on the unmasked example. Um, in 2019, we also created an API for the uh, people database, which is available on our data services page. So other projects can now pull in information from TM people automatically. So if you're interested in that, make sure to check that out. Uh, and finally, in 2019, we partnered up with the Lexicon of Greek Personal Names, also a very long running project. Um, they've basically finished all the other provinces in the Eastern Mediterranean, and the only region left to tackle was Egypt. Um, and well, it would have been a bit silly to start from scratch. So they're working in, in our database uh, at the moment, and they're updating um, the data there. Um, right now, they're focusing on Lower Egypt and the Fayoum, and the plan is to have a follow-up project uh, in 2022 that focuses on um, Upper Egypt. So I'm really, really grateful uh, for their help with this. Uh, now, for the remaining 20 minutes, I'd like to show you um, the new website, or at least what's, what's finished for the new website. So I'm just going to switch to um, my browser uh, here. So this is the um, just make it this homepage, um, as you can see. Uh, it's actually already possible to use the central search for uh, names. I'm not sure a lot of people realize this. Um, and um, so I put a little exercise online on the GitHub page. I don't know if anyone took a look at this. Um, so you can, for example, look for, like I said, the name uh, Horus in the central search. Uh, it takes a while because that's a large database. Uh, and then here uh, it says that you've looked for Horus, the personal name. And here you get the results uh, that the name Horus appears in 4,641 texts. So if you use the central search, the results are on the text level. You don't get the number of attestations for this name. You don't get the number of people bearing this name. You get the number of texts in which uh, the name appears. Here you do get an overview of the attestations of the people and the people. Uh, it's briefly mentioned, uh, but the list gives texts in which you uh, this name. But uh, what may be interesting for some people um, uh, for this setup is that you can uh, show the results uh, on a map of Egypt. Um, again, it takes some time to load. Um, so here you can see uh, the geographical spread of the name Horus. Uh, the default map uh, shows absolute figures. Um, so here in the Fayoum, for example, you can see that there are 1,458 texts mentioning uh, the name Horus. Um, you can also um, look at uh, proportional numbers here. So we have the absolute mode, but you can switch here to percentages. Uh, if you do that, the whole map covers red because your uh, nominator and denominator are the same. But if you remove the criteria in the, no in the denominator, um, what you're basically saying then is show me um, how many texts mentioning the name Horus, or show me the percentage of all texts that contain the name Horus in this region. Um, and then you can see that there's no region that really stands out a lot anymore, but that's more a problem of the scale we use for coloring the map. It's something we need to change. Um, but if you click on a region, then you can see that of all texts in the Fayoum region, 6% mention the name Horus. Um, so this way you can kind of play around um, with the data a bit. Um, you do have to be careful though. Um, so for a region like the Fayoum, there isn't really a problem because we have a lot of, of text from this region. But for example, if you click on 
the uh, Afroditopolites, you see that there are actually only three texts. Uh, and these three texts consist of only 0.06% of all available documents from this region. So you do have to check for yourself if the data is statistically relevant. We just offer the data, but the interpretation of the data is uh, up to you. So that's just something um, you, you need to take into account. Um, you can also add extra criteria um, in the central search. So for example, um, you can say, I want to um, find the name Popertaios, but only texts that were written in the third century BC. Um, and then again, um, here you get the interpretation of your search. Third century BC is the date of the text, and Popertaios is the personal name, and then you see that you have 164 texts answering to this criteria. Again, you can show them on a map of Egypt. Um, and here you see that in absolute figures, it's mainly the Fayum, and here the Theban area. Uh, again, you can, um, you can uh, switch to relative mode. For example, if you remove the name Fotortayas from the denominator, you're uh, simply looking for all texts mentioning Fotortayas in the third century compared to all texts from the third century in general. And this is the results. Um, OK, so this is briefly to show that you can use the central search um, for some, some basic stuff. Uh, if you want to do a more advanced search, um, it's better to go to the people database. Um, now, at the moment, the old version is still online. So this is the version launched in 2011. Uh, so that's 10 years ago now. Um, as you can see, it still says that it's the, the beta version. We've never really updated it, so it's high time we do. Um, so, but I'm going to uh, show you the new version, which is this. So this will be the new homepage for people. Um, so when you land on this page, what you get in the first place is an overview of the names database. So here you see that we have over 35,000 names in the database. And here you get a basic breakdown, um, the linguistic origins. Uh, so most of the names in the database are Egyptian. There's actually a large part of the names for which we don't know what the linguistic origins are. And then there are Greek, the, the third largest group are Greek names. Here, there's a breakdown according to gender. And the third chart we added are um, gods used in these names. Um, so for example, when, when people have the name, like for example, the name Horus mentions the name, the god Horus in the name, for example. Uh, and then the way dates chart here is a chronological overview of all the people bearing these names. Um, which in this case, if you land on the page, is basically a chart of all people in our database. But you can use these charts to filter your results. So um, for example, if you say, I'm only interested in female names, if you click on that in the pie chart, your charts change. You see that for female names, more than half are Egyptian, followed by Greek. Uh, and that ISIS is the most important to define element. And here too, the chronological overview is now limited to people with a female name. And so is the list at the bottom of the page. So everything is, is connected to each other and adapted. And you can see that we have 6,359 female names in the database. You can filter even further. For example, you can click on ISIS, and then you get all female names mentioning the god ISIS. And again, everything changes. So, this way you can kind of um, play around with it uh, to see what we have. Um, yeah. The, um, the actual search fields on top, so here in the family tree, the, the 
field in dark green is your main search field. This is where you do simple searches. So when you look for a specific person a specific, or a specific name, um, you can either use our stable identifiers. So the TM bit ID for people, the TM num ID for names, or you can just enter a name. So uh, if we say, for example, uh, TM num 4240, you are taken to the page for that name. This is the name Nails. Uh, and this is the, the, the detail page for that name. Um, so in the top, you see some metadata. You see the standard variants in Greek, Egyptian, Coptic. Apparently, we don't have the name in Latin yet, so it's not filled in. Uh, this is a Greek name. It's a theophoric name. It refers to the god Nelos, but it's also a name that refers to a location, namely the river Nile. And so there's also a link to our place database uh, here. And if we have some bibliography, it's also shown. Um, again, we, we have various charts here, so you can play around with, with the data again. The default view for the name page are the attestations. So here below, you get a list of their, so the name Nails is attested 1,063 times for 777 different people. So the list below shows all the attestations of this name with the publication, uh, the exact attestation of the name, some extra information. Uh, but again, here you can filter um, your criteria. So you can filter on the basis of the language of the text, uh, the writing surface of the text, where the text was written, if the name is used as a given name, or here double means that it's used as the second name and the double name, uh, cluster rules. I explained when talking about NER what we mean by cluster rules. So if you say I'm only interested and those attestations where Nelos appears as uh, patronymic, you can click on father here and the results are adapted and so on. So you can play around with that. Um, if you say, well, I'm not just interested in attestations, I actually just, I want to see the individuals with this name. You can uh, click here and it switches to the person view. And then here you get a list of all the people with the name. Uh, Nailos and a chronological overview of those people. The uh, third um, section for, for the names is the name variants. Um, so Nailos is the standard variant, uh, but sometimes the spelling variant Nilos is used in Greek. Um, there are others uh, for that. It's best to switch to table view. Um, I discovered this morning that for some reason Ols is part of this name. Uh, I checked those and these were all mistakes. So these have been deleted in the FileMaker version. So this will be updated next week. So here you get an overview of all the variants of this name. Um, and if they're written in Greek, Egyptian, Coptic, or Latin. And uh, here you get a list of these variants. If you click on the ID, oh, that's still the old page, sorry. Um, that doesn't work yet, but it will bring you to the new page for um, the name variant where you also get options to filter and so on. So we want to make it as dynamic as possible. Um, the same goes for people. If you're looking for a specific person, all you have to do is type in the person ID and you're brought to the corresponding page for the person uh, you have here. Uh, information about the metadata um, about the person. So if there are family relations, the people are shown here. You can click on them and then you go to their um, person page. Uh, as you can see, if they are part of the PP, we still show the PP numbers because it's still used um, in older literature. So people have a point of reference there. Um, here, this is for uh, the RDF. Um, which you can also download here on uh, the page for individual people as well. And then below you get an overview of the attestations. And again, you can filter according to several criteria. 
and then if you click on one of the attestations in the list, you go to the attestation of the person uh, himself. Uh, so actually in this text, the name Drutoni was crossed out, um, as you can see. So here you have information on that, where the name is mentioned, uh, the date, provenance of the text. Uh, if uh, a designation of origin is mentioned, we have it here. If a function is mentioned, we have it here. Uh, in this case, uh, in this text, Duton apparently borrowed something. Um, so yeah, we try to add as much uh, information as possible. Um, if you're not really sure um, what the ID number is, you can also just enter uh, a name here. So uh, for example, if you say Socrates, uh, you get the number of attestations and the number of individuals. And then here you can choose what you're interested in. If you're interested in the name, you're taken to uh, the corresponding name page. If you're interested in attestations, you're taken to the corresponding attestations page. And if you're interested in the people bearing the name, you're taken to the people page. Uh, and the family tree also allows you to combine criteria. So for example, you can say, I want to find all people called Heracleides, whose father is um, called Lucy Michaels. In this case, you get three results. And three results are listed here below, and they take you to the person page. Um, this is very basic at the moment, but we're planning on expanding this. This is why the, the website isn't live yet. So what I'm going to add is that you don't have to enter a complete name, but you can also, for example, search for um, well, what we call divine elements. So that um, if you say here, if you if you um, if you enter the the god Isis, for example, um, and you enter the same criterion for the father's name, you get all people who have a name that contain the goddess Isis with a father whose name also contains the goddess Isis. And we'll also be doing this for elements of compound names. So it will be possible to say that, for example, to search for all people whose name ends in Doros, who also have a father or a mother whose name ends in Doros or Dora for the mother. Um, so it will be possible to do much more advanced searches uh, when that's implemented then. So these things aren't really possible yet at the moment, also in the old version. So uh, it's something we'd like to implement before, um, before the, uh, the database goes live. Um, and then very quickly, because I see that my time is almost up, we also have um, a separate search page for attestations of names. Um, this is because it's a bit more complex than, than searching on the name or the person level. So here you can search for names in a specific language or script in a specific case, for example, and also um, where the name is in a specific uh, position. So if it's used as a binomen or nomen, as a given name, as the second name in the double name, or the third name in the triple name, for example. Um, so, uh, for example, if you search for, oh, that's not right. Uh, Valerio, in Greek, uh, you get 318 attestations, uh, but you can add extra criteria to that. So for example, if you say, I'm only interested in those instances where Valerio appears as the second name in a double name, you can tick this box. Uh, and then you see that that's the case for 14 attestations. Uh, and then you can even add extra criteria and say, for example, I only want to find attestations of Valerio as a double name where uh, the person or the name is used as a pat patronymic, and that leaves um, four results. Um, you can even add text criteria to this. So you can limit this to certain dates, provenance, um, writing material, and so on. So this is a much more advanced 
um, search form uh, that will also be um, made available uh, soon. Uh, but there's still a lot of things I need to tweak there. So it's not um, entirely ready yet, but I hope to uh, put it online uh, during the summer. So um, I'm going to leave it at that because I see that my time is up. Um, okay. Okay, excellent, Ayane. Uh, thank you very much. So it was great to see um, all the complexities of onomastics and prosopography through this making. So there is a lot, a lot of work behind. So really, it's great. Uh, really, thank you. Okay, so I think we can um, open our discussion. So please, for our audience, if you have questions, you can write your questions in the chat. And uh, Okay, let's see if... Uh... Well, I have a question about uh, the last uh, resource that uh, you were showing. So thank you for showing the new uh, web page for Trismegistos people, which is super cool. So <laughs> we look forward to it uh, because we can understand how much work is behind. So you showed the possibility to search for names, but also for the name of the father and the name of the mother. So I have two questions. So you can just search uh, uh, the name uh, in the field father and uh, get, of course, information about uh, uh, the occurrences of a, of a name as a father, I imagine, or as a mother. But to get these relationships, of course, we have elements in uh, ancient languages. And uh, the interesting thing is that Trismegistos is a, a multi-language resource because there are, uh, of course, names in different languages. But that's the thing. So you showed examples for Greek. Uh, we can get, uh, for example, the patronymic or the matronymic, thanks to the genitive, usually. Uh, but then, uh, um, to establish more complex relationships. So that's the, the difficult part. So I think the, the semi-automatic work because we can get, uh, okay, linguistic data. And there, there is a lot of work is also for our audience. So because uh, uh, as you said, so uh, in the case of Greek, Greek is an inflected language. So we have to get uh, the, the inflected form and the lemma. Then we, of course, we have to, um, basically to annotate the genitive is, uh, I don't know, the patronymic, etc. But then to get more complex relationships, uh, how do you work on that? So do you, this is the, I know that you're working on linguistic uh, data and now uh, if I'm not wrong, there is a lot of work in Trismegistos to, to include uh, um, linguistic annotations, but how, how do you work on that part? Um. Yeah. That's, um, I myself don't really, don't really do that. So, so we have a collaborator from Greek studies, Alec Kiersmakers, um, who did the whole lemmatization. Um, but specifically for names, he kind of ignored them because we already have TM people and because they pose so much problems. So he consciously decided not to um, work on onomastic uh, data. Also, he, he also uh, ignored place names. Um, so yeah, basically what we have is what we, we have through either named entity recognition or from close reading the text. So if, um, if a person never adds a patronymic, but we know from close reading the text that the father is person B, we add that data manually. So it's a kind of a combination of the two. Um, but I don't know. Okay. If you have a question. No, 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 no. Thank you for this answer because this this is important to understand the complexity of this work. As I imagine, yes, of course. So that's the thing. We need <laughs> this standard close reading. Of course, yeah. is inevitable uh, as for now, at least. And uh, thank you also for mentioning the work of Alec because he was presenting uh, two weeks ago um, for Pedalion. I know his work for Papyr. I know that he's ignoring <laughs> and, uh, personal names and place names, but there is a reason, of course, uh, because uh, this is another part of the work. But this is just to show uh, the, the complexity okay, of this kind of work. Also, because in Trismegistos we have text, uh, but also uh, editions. So there is, uh, we have many different levels, uh, ancient sources in different languages, but also a lot of uh, uh, secondary sources, because this is the great uh, part of Trismegistos, including 
also uh, bibliography, bibliographic references. So there is a lot of editorial work done in the past in a printed world, done today in the digital world. So there are so many layers we can combine them. For example, for onomastics and prosopography, the, uh, this kind of work is fundamental, of course, to get information. If we can't get, if we can't, if we can't uh, um, get them digitally, uh, but that that. These, uh, these, uh, all these layers uh, add uh, more complexity. So thank you for, for, for your answer. <laughs> okay. Other questions? I have another question for, uh, um, okay, thank you for adding the exercise in, um, in uh, GitHub, so for our audience and especially our students, you can play, okay, with Trismegistos. Uh, and uh, um, yes, of course, uh, you, we need uh, um, a subscription for, for accessing uh, Trismegistos today. Um, uh, but okay, uh, I'm reading. Um, yes, that's the thing. In any case, today um, we need uh, we need a trans uh, we need a subscription, which is okay. Another um, problem that we have today to sustain projects. We know the problem, okay, uh, and this Megistos has been offering a huge amount of data for free, open. Uh, but uh, this is the situation of today, of course, we need the community supporting um, uh, Trismegistos. Uh, so this is the thing. In any case, for accessing this resource, uh, you need a subscription. Yes, yeah, so, but it's, um, it's for, the, for the functionality part of the website. So if you want to visualize things, you, you will need a subscription. The data okay. Yeah, the data itself is all still open access. So we don't put any uh, metadata behind the paywall. It's really just for the charts, for the maps, um, the functionality okay. behind it, that uh, unit is driven. But we never, we're never going to put the data behind the paywall. We want the data to remain open access. Yeah, that's very important. Okay. Well. Okay. Okay. Yes. Thank you for this, and thank you for this effort. So this is important, also for our students, uh, because I understand we want everything for free, but uh, this work is expensive. So there are costs. It's not only because it's difficult to get funds for uh, projects uh, on a historical language, but in general today there is a lot of work, and today uh, we can see. So there are costs, and the big discussion today is how we can distribute these costs. So Trismegistos is an example, not only uh, because there are uh, less funds today, but also because for the future, we have the, the community has to think how we can distribute costs, who yeah. has to pay for what and, uh, and where. So th this is an important discussion, I think. Yeah. But then, so I, the, the, uh, I'm looking at the, at the chat. And or, uh, uh, Gabby, please. Um, if we're if we're still while we're still waiting for the audience to um, come, come up with questions from their questions to percolate through the time um, time delay um, mm -hmm. on YouTube, um, I have a question about the relationship between Trismegistos and Lexicon and Greek personal names. I'm I'm really interested in this joint project, as as you know, mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering what what's going to happen to the, the the data produced by this project. Does it um, does the data become Trismegistos content? Does it become Lexicon of the Greek Personal Names content? Does it go in both places? Obviously, Greek Personal Names, it'll go into their printed volume. Um, does it also go into their um, TIXML encoded database? Does it go into Trismegistos as well? Two different formats, slightly more merged, different data in each, because you each have different data formats. Could you, could you say a little bit more about that relationship? Yeah. So um, at the moment, in the first stage, they are working directly in Trismegistos in the attestation database. Um, so uh, they are checking the readings of the name in our database. They are adding missing data in our database. Uh, when that is done, the attestations will be exported to the LGPN uh, environment. Um, and that's where they will be doing the prosopographical identifications. We've done that on purpose because, um, well, 
process graphical identification is always a bit tricky. Not everyone always agrees on this. So that way they can do what they think is best in their environment and we have our data the way we think is best. So on the level of attestations, the data is going to be exactly the same. On the prosopographical level, there will probably be differences. Another difference is that um, LGPN only goes up to the name variant level. They don't have the overarching name level. So um, Apollonios with double lambda is an entry in their database, and Apollonios with a single lambda is an entry in their database. They don't link that to a standard Apollonios. So that will also be another difference in LGPN. They only go to the variant level in Trismegistus. You go one level um, higher. Um, we will link to LGPN. Um, I assume they'll be linking back to us as well. So um, if there are differences on the prosopographical level, for example, then we can say, look, if you go to LGPN, there it's different than it is in our environment. Uh, and then there's, of course, yeah, the printed volumes, um, which they're still going to do. I'm not sure how they're going to do that particularly, because compared to um, the other provinces up till now, the data is much, much larger. Um, so, yeah, I think we'll have to see how that's going to work in practice. Um, but, yeah, so there's they're still planning on doing the print publication, but they also have their um, their database as well. And so it corresponds up to a certain level, and there will be some differences. Right. That's 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 really useful to know because I mean, obviously, the LGPN also have um, have different criteria for inclusion. They're only interested up to a certain date. They're only interested in names that are either in Greek or of Greek people. Mm -hmm. um, so that you know, they're not interested in Roman names. They won't be interested in Egyptian names unless yeah. they're written in Greek. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And so forth. And um, and I guess they will. You know, if there's four volumes worth, they'll have to do it as four volumes um, yeah. in, in print, which you know um, mm -hmm. is always always the way it's worked, which is yeah. you know, which is which is lovely. Um, and I, I I very much take your point, and I, I really like your answer. I mean, it's a better answer than I was than I was expecting actually. That 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 the prosopographical interpretations will be different across the two, mm -hmm. um, because I remember when we were doing um, uh, work for for Snapdragon, which will. For the audience who don't know what that is, we'll talk a bit more about that next week. Um, uh, one of the things we did was try to find people who are mentioned both in Trismegistos people and in the lexicon Greek personal names. And there were a few, even though LGPN hadn't done Egypt yet and, and Trismegistos was mostly focusing on Egypt. There were a few hundred, in fact. Um, and we found them because the LGPN had mentioned them by their PP number. Oh, yeah. um, and in at least one case, in the bibliography, it had their, their PP number. And in at least one case, it had um, a person in LGPN who had three PP numbers, mm. because the because Trismegistos, previously PP, um, call, have three person records for that person. They they say it's three people. Um, yeah, that's kind of um, so. If there are three PP numbers, it doesn't necessarily mean that there are three people in our database um, because PP is not just a number awarded to a person, but to a person in a particular function. Right. So um, normally these have now all been identified in our database as one person with the TM number with three PP numbers linked to it. So it's even more complicated than that. Yeah. 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 In, in this case, it was um, it was still separate PM oh, number yeah. um, and what it was, I, I don't remember the third one, but two of them were um, both mentioned in the same inscription and it was ambiguous as to whether they were the same person or a grandfather and grandson. With like, the same yeah. Name. Yeah. Um, and so it's, it's, it wasn't a difference in interpretation. Okay. It was simply that Trismegistus says, well, it might be two different people, so we'll give them two numbers. Yeah. And LGPN said it might be the same person, so we'll give them one number. Yeah, okay. okay. Um, but, 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 but both perfectly valid. Mm -hmm. yeah, good, right. good that you're doing it separately for that reason. Yeah, uh-huh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so in Trismegistus, we generally tend to the cautious side. If we are not 100% certain, we don't identify because it's much easier to merge people later when new evidence emerges than to pull them apart again. So, yeah. We do have, I didn't show that, it's something that will 
um, show up in the, the new version of the website as well. We do have a field where we mark the identifiers of people that might be the same so that you can, that you're referred to their person files as well. So people can um, see who are possible, uh, possibly the same people. Um, so this will be something that will be shown on the new website as well. It's also a technical decision, isn't it? If you've got yeah, two, yeah, yeah. Um, if you've got two records, you can say different things about each. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you've only got one record, you can say in prose, but it might be two different people. But you've got no way of using mm -hmm. the identifiers to say that. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Thank you for this discussion. Also for our audience, I added the link of uh, to the AGPN lexicon of personal names. I'm saying that for our students next week, uh, we will talk about this resource, which was originally originally conceived as a. Um, as a printed publication in more volumes arranged by uh, Greek regions, basically. And uh, this discussion is uh, showing the complexity of working with uh, onomastics. And I agree uh, today, at least, because uh, the thing is that to, to have at least a, a gazetteer of names with inflected forms and lemmata. And then in the GPN, we have basically lemmata because they publish the, the, the lemma of the name, the nominative, basically. Today, we want to add also the inflected forms because they are fundamental. But then, and this is probably one of the, the limits of a digital environment, because if we begin to add a label to identify uh, a name, uh, then we we can get in troubles. Of course, we want to propose identifications, but this is uh, the complex part, ambiguities. There are many, many uh, ambiguities in ancient sources, so and especially for, for names, especially for attestations in, in inscriptions and papyri, because we have to consider also that we have different genres, like literary text, inscriptions, papyri, etc. So, um, but next week, we will discuss more about that. So Trismegistus is really, um, even if you are not an expert of an mass, or even if you are not a, a classicist or an ancient historian, a scholar, to, to, to just to, to access Trismegistos and see the, the, the data um, gives you a sense of the complexity of historical data. I'm saying that because in our audience we have students in computer science, they are interested in problems concerning dealing with data about historical languages. So uh, I think that this biggest, in any case, is a, is, is a difficult resource, of course, because you have to spend some time uh, to, to understand the data, but in any, in any case, it's accessible, and you can immediately uh, see uh, the, the complexities, OK? Even if you are not an expert of onomastics and prosopography of ancient Egypt, uh, even if you don't know the languages in the end, of course, there is a level where you can access this resource and immediately <laughs> to <laughs> see these complexities. But now, so back to our uh, chat. So there was a comment uh, by, um, ah, okay, uh, Anise Ferreira, our colleague from Araraquara in Brazil. Uh, well, yes, <laughs> how many people work in the team? Um, uh, well, uh, yes, um, you answered. Um, well, there is a fluctuation. The different people has been wor have been working on Trismegistos, of course, but we know that now <laughs> um, you uh, and really Clarissa, you have this uh, big <laughs> responsibility, and uh, so we know that uh, there is a lot of uh, of work. But you have the expertise so um, for working on that, and so really, even more congratulations for the work that you have been doing. Yeah. because we know that is a huge, huge work. There's also two slightly different questions, aren't there? One is how many, you know, official full-time paid staff are there on the yeah. team? And there's how many people have contributed yeah. something to the project over, you know, oh, recently? Yes. And that's the yeah, second yeah. is really a lot bigger. Yeah, 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 yeah. So there are a lot, a lot of people who have contributed. Um, I'm in contact with a lot of people, um, students, PhD students who for their PhD, um, do a lot of stuff who send me their data to help. So, so we have a lot of volunteers, so to say, uh, which I'm very, very grateful. Um, but in terms of people being paid, um, I can say at the moment, no one. <laughs> uh, well, okay, there's the project director, Mark DePau, of course, he's, he's faculty staff, but um, that's it. <laughs> um, so, yeah. But we get a lot, a lot of help from the community. So that's really, really 
Yes, and I think this is another interesting thing because we, before we discussed the problem of funding, but also the problem of understanding uh, where we want to go and how we can distribute costs because technology is expensive. But then also in this case, okay, uh, we can have more people, less people. There are moments uh, where we have no people <laughs> in this text. But again, another important thing, so, uh, and this is what you are doing. So you are building an infrastructure that can be used by different people in different moments today in the future uh, by linguists classicists uh, egyptologists uh, epigraphists computer scientists so this is also the real question today if we want to preserve our heritage is not only to preserve somewhere in database but uh, accessibility means also this uh, to produce data can be uh, that can be accessed and used by different people in different situations in different institutions in different periods of time okay today we have less people maybe tomorrow we'll have more people uh, but uh, uh, the idea to to have the possibility really to share this data and to uh, go on with the work is fundamental and this is uh, uh, and, and this means a lot of work because the work is not only to interpret data and to collect the data but also to build this infrastructure and today there is a lot of work in general for linked open data in different projects for um, also for converting past data, because this is another problem. We already have computational data, but produced 20, 30 years ago, and they are today, uh, well, uh, they have to be revised, they have to be converted into uh, modern standards. So this is another layer of complexity, but we can identify today two main problems, funding in general, costs to be distributed, and then second, to produce a structure that can be used by different people in different uh, uh, fields, in different situations, in different institutions, and in different periods of time for the future, which is one of our duties, okay, to preserve <laughs> our <laughs> heritage. Okay, uh, so another question, in another comment in, uh, in the chat. Uh, I'm not sure, do you mean the, the database, the, the FileMaker database, or I'm not sure what's meant. Let's see if uh, an is uh, the administrative interface of the data. So I think a related question, if you know, while we're waiting for her to clarify, is um, it's obviously there's lots and lots of features in the in the, the database interface that you that you showed, um, and a subset of those features are are available for search for for the users. Um, do you think there are any? I mean, obviously. There's a whole question of web design interface, web interface design, and, and so forth. But is there any? Um, are there any features other than editing that that are in the database that, that wouldn't, in theory, be be useful to to some web users? Um, yeah, sure. But do you have to distinguish? It's not that um, it's it's not that if you can't search for it, then we don't make it available online. For example, yeah. so like new things we'll be adding now are. Uh, person's age when we have it, person's physical description and stuff like that. Um, so this will all be available. You can't really search for these, but they will be available on the detail page. And so they are consultable by by the user. So yeah, there we won't be able to to allow you to search for everything we have in the database that makes it just too complex. But we will try to show as much as possible. What about a free text search? Could could you could you allow people to search for everything doing something like that? Um, I'm sorry, I didn't break that. A, a free text search, just if they search for a word and they find it in any field, that way that one way of finding stuff. Oh, like that, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm not sure how and how far that we can accommodate that because for that you need more of a full text, and we don't sure. really have that. Yeah. Yeah. Well. We have a kind of a full text for Greek papyri, but that's kind of reconstructed on the basis of our yeah. words on the lemata. So, um, so I was asking more conceptually rather than technically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it possible to design the database so that? But but might that be something that would be useful? Um, um, it would definitely be useful, but I think that in order to make that work, that would need to be done in close collaboration with papyri.info, for example, because they right. have canonical text. Yeah. Um, the text we show is already five years old by now, so already it's outdated in a lot of cases. If people start 
updating the text on papyri.info, it's already different from what we show. So to do something like that, uh, we need to work with papyri.info, and we would really like to, because of course it's also important to keep our TM words database up to date. Um, so we've been thinking about creating this kind of parallel system in which we constantly feed each other information. Because now also, for example, if I correct the reading of a name in Trismegistos, I have to go to the papyrological navigator separately and correct it there again. It would be much more easier if there was a system where we could just feed it to each other. Um, so yeah, that would be great if we could if we could set up something like that. Yeah. Yes, again, thank you also for this disguise. <laughs> so we have many, many uh, possible um, uh, questions. Uh, this is important, again, for our students to, to remember. So Trismegistos, first of all, is a set of extracted data, if I can say that, uh, uh, with a lot of interpretation. The focus in this case for people is to focus on names. So we have extracted data, inflected forms, the lemma, and then uh, the forms in different languages. But then we have the text, of course, which is another thing. This is the reason why now, um, well, we can't really just search the text. And what kind of text? These are mainly a papyri. We also have now inscriptions, so complex text, fragmentary text, where we also have an editorial work. This is the reason why Yanni was saying, well, if I edit a name, then I should edit this in a text. But the text means in a specific edition of the text. And of course, we have for a papyri, we have papyri.info. So there are many complexities. F uh, complexities about sources, uh, but also computational complexities. And another effort today is to, in, uh, to, to, to connect, so link and open that, okay? This is uh, where the community is working, to connect resources belonging to different projects produced in the past, in the past 20, 30 years. And of course, also in that case, there is a lot of work to combine. And I know, we know that there is a lot of, a lot of uh, work and effort in the community. So thank you also for uh, for pointing to this uh, to this problem. But then back to the chat. So Anise, uh, she answered. Yes, she said back data and file maker. Um, so maybe yeah. I I can. Okay, I'm adding. Okay, here we have your screen. Um, yeah. So this is. Um... Can you can can you? Okay, excellent. Thank you. So this is just a screenshot of a record in our ref database. So an attestation of the person Isidoros, also called Faesis. Um, a lot of the data you see here is actually pulled in from related tables. So here you have the Namva case table, as I talked about, the name variant table, and the name table. This is also pulled in from the name table. So if it's a theophoric name, as is the case here, the god is shown here. So both names are Isis names. The language of the name uh, is shown here. This is pulled in from the text database. So it has information about the language of the text, the archive the text belongs to, the type of text, the provenance, the date. Um, this is the function database. So it's also pulled in from there. So in this particular instance, so on line six um, here, here's the, the person's identification. So Isidoros Theonos Oskai Daes Theotos. He's uh, actually, he's a Mistophoron Hippeon. Um, so we add that data here, but also to the function database. Uh, it also says that he's a Perses, so this is his ethnic, and he is from Crocodilon Polis. Um, that's entered here. And then a link is also made with the places database to link um, these designations of origin to the actual TM places database. So there's a lot of information that's actually pulled in from other databases. Um, and I think the only information that is entered directly here is here. This is information about what the person does in this particular instance in the text. So here he sells a dove cart and empty land. Um, and this is information about this the identification cluster in this particular um, instance. Um, his age is also mentioned here in the text. So he's 50 years old and a physical description is given. Um, 
we have a lot of other fields that aren't filled in here for bibliography. We have um, notes which appear online, internal comments. Um, so yeah, there's a lot, a lot in here. There, um, there are also a lot of fields that are not visible here that are used to calculate things, for example. Um, so yeah, it's, it's very, very complex, but we try to make it as efficient as possible by pulling in as much information from related tables uh, as possible. So yeah, I don't know if that's... No, thank you for this. So this uh, uh, um, structure, this database, uh, again, for our students, uh, uh, you, you can immediately see, even if you can't read the text, you don't know anything about this text, you can immediately uh, see from this structure the complexity, ancient sources, editorial work, different databases. These are the three main <laughs> big uh, complexities. Um, okay, so unfortunately now our time is over, but Yane, thank you very much okay, for this uh, presentation, also for updating us about uh, uh, the work currently done. Okay, very few people, <laughs> Uh, not funds, but still, Trismegistus is super active. So <laughs> there is a lot, a lot of work, even in, in this situation. So really, thank you. Now, next week, um, we have again another session about uh, uh, onomastics and prosopography. Uh, Gabriel and I will, uh, will, will talk a bit more about the lexicon of three personal names. We will show uh, and snap Dragon, okay, we will see what it is, and then other uh, work currently done for onomastics and prosopography for historical data. Uh, and then we will have, an, again, another session. Uh, so um, this semester we have uh, groups of sessions. Uh, we had linguistics, and now we have name entities, onomastics, prosopography, name entity recognition. And then we will have a third session about annotating geographical data. So it's not onomastics, but uh, there is a relation, of course, uh, to these uh, to these sessions okay so i i thank you so thank you Yanne, for for joining us today good luck for your work so we are very we look forward to the new resource uh, we hope for the summer and uh, okay so uh, see you uh, goodbye good afternoon good morning <laughs> wherever you are uh, in, uh, for, because our audience is spread in the, in the world and uh, see you uh, next week okay bye bye thank you Yanne.